Hello, my name is Simon Mayhew Archer. Uh, I am a producer and writer. Uh, I run a small production company called Camden Productions. And my uh, biggest hit that I've made is a comedy program called This Country. They'd made a pilot for ITV. And so I got sent that and I watched it and I hated it. And I thought, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to do this. But I took, I thought, well, I'll go and meet them anyway. And so I went down to the Cotswolds, to Sirencester, met up with them. It turned out that they also hated their pilot. And so that was a great uh, starting point. And that was the, you know, the, the great joy of, of doing this country was we all had the same sense of humour. We all, we all knew what we wanted to do. We found the same things funny. And so then you can... You know, that's when you can really drive and go into, you know, to get into real depth and stuff because mm. you're not having... So there were still it. relatively new writers, though? Yeah, very new. I mean, yeah. they'd written one one pilot and... And somehow got it to ITV. Yeah, so Daisy had made a taster um, just of her in character as Carrie and her, you know, her talent is so evident that everybody was was all over it fantastic okay so you've got two new writers and you've got an, a great idea and you've brought on a, a director and you're all heading the same way how what's what's the what's the producer role in all that what were you doing and what do they do or were you much more cohesive than some groups might be yeah I mean <clears throat> the way we worked was that we would we would storyline all the episodes together so that part of the writing was a, a a totally collaborative process so we would have you know we would come with ideas for for things and um yeah it's kind of like you so you would draw the the roadmap together of an episode and you know i suppose i've always been like I, I'm very I, I like plot I like structure and story and so it was always about okay so like this is the kind of the theme or the area we want to explore how do we turn that into an interesting story that's got like you know that keeps you guessing as an audience member you, you know you don't just want a story to be completely linear where one you know one thing happens after another it's it's got to come where there's there's conflict and you know the characters are making life difficult for themselves and each other and that's what's so great about Kerry and Curtin is that they're complete you know they're very complicated people and they're so you know they're they're tied together by the bond of being cousins and you know through you know there's very few other young people in the village and so they're they're connected on such a deep level, but then their personalities are, you know, it's like the odd couple. It's like one's a lazy slob and one's a sort of very <laughs> fastidious, sort of uh, slightly sno snobby one. And is that essential? Um, do you think in in comedy in in writing? I th yes, but it has to come organically. Like that's that, that and that's what makes it hard. It's like. I'm sure we've all read outlines or scripts where the characters are all opposite and actually it doesn't sustain because you'd just be like, well, you just leave, you know, it's like, stop, stop hanging out, <laughs> go else. And so you, that's the, the key is always about trapping them. And you know, trapping them in a trapping them in a hierarchy is useful as well. So it's like what I like about Kerry and Curtin is that in lots of ways Kerry is the dominant partner, but actually she needs Curtin more than Curtin needs her. And so there's a kind of there's a that's a dynamic that you can always play with. Um and it, yeah, it's just like sorry. No, carry on. I didn't want to interrupt you, and I did. Well, it's like it's why, fa like my dad's got a thing about families in sitcoms, which is that 
even sitcoms that aren't about families. We should say work, that your but... dad, we should, inter I can, and now I will interrupt you. Your dad is Paul Mayhew Archer, who co-wrote Vicar of Dibley and many other things. Yes, and that is responsible for my nepotistic rise in the comedy industry. Um, so his thing was that, like, if you look at it, Porridge is the great example, which is that you've got, um, oh my God, Fletcher and Godbo are the, the brothers, and then Mackay is the disciplinarian dad, and forgive me, what's the other? I can't remember the other. Um, the tall, the tall warden. Uh, but he's like the soft mum. And so you have all of the interdynamics of a family unit with all the playfulness and the love and the hate. But it's just played out in a prison and, you know, they're not actually related. Yeah. And it's yeah. interesting, Fa you know, Father you look Ted at... Ted is another one, isn't it? Father yeah. Ted is a classic where, I mean, she almost does play the mother even though she isn't the mother and the, the granddad sits on the side even though he's not the granddad and the the dad yeah. and the son and it, they're all there yeah exactly and it's because you want your lead characters to be it to be stuck in the middle it's like there are some people they can boss around and there are some people that boss them around it's blackadder blackadder gives you know baldrick the shit but then he has to take it from everybody else so it's um it's just it just creates natural avenues for comedy Brilliant. Um, so talk to me a little bit more about plot and structure and story. Because this country, in to all intents and purposes, in, in many ways, wasn't a sitcom. You're right. It was so naturalistic. But the plot and the structure, would you say that that was, was the structure of a sitcom? Or did you? Yes, very much so. It's pretty much every episode even the free ranging ones where they sort of we'd always try and do one episode like for, they're called bottle apps you know and they started because you know for financial practical reasons which is you try and set an episode in one room with as few characters as possible um because you can shoot it quicker and it buys you time elsewhere in the in the schedule mm. so one still my my grave, favorite episode. Goes entirely in the bar sorry one foot in the grave where he's in the bar. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And there's what I think there's another one foot in the grave where they're in a traffic jam the whole episode. Right. And um so my favourite episodes in all three series probably is still Oven Space, which is all in the kitchen. Oh yes. Um, yes. And really the plot of that is that it's kind of like a sort of you know, piss take of waiting for Godot, but they're waiting for Uncle Nugget. And it's about whether or not they're going to eat the frozen pizza. And that's right. It, but even in that, it's like you still give your character, there are still uh, wants that your characters have that are driving them through the episode. So that it, it doesn't just, you know, that one really is a lot of chat. But there is still kind of undulations and, and you know, hopefully you're kind of... One of the interesting things when we were doing that is that obviously because Uncle Nugget never shows up, we never cast Uncle Nugget. There was no Uncle Nugget. And it was only when we got into the edit that I realised that that totally signposts, the fact that you don't see Uncle Nugget is a huge problem. And so we then went back and and we cast an Uncle Nugget, a bloke from, there's a modelling agency called Ugly, which specialises in yes, <laughs> unusual looking individuals. So we cast this guy to be Uncle Nugget. And uh, Daisy and Charlie came to London and uh, my assistant, Inez, went, and went to a pub and a McDonald's with them and just took a bunch of photos. And then we printed them out put them in frames and then reshot uh, just some inserts of Kerry and Curtin showing photos of Uncle Nugget. And there's actually a photo of Uncle Nugget with their auntie, like who he was supposedly married to in the show. And that is, uh, that is a bit of Photoshop handiwork by yours truly, because we really <laughs> were the lowest budget show. And that is probably still my proudest moment. 
Um, and, and, and suddenly, because you you've seen him on sub some on some subconscious level, I think as an audience, you go, "Oh, they've cut like he's a real person. He is going to show up." So it just makes it that little bit more kind of surprising and satisfying when, of course, you know, he doesn't <laughs> turn up. Yeah. So the surprise at the end is as important as it is in any sitcom. I think it's just about like there's there's a guy called Brent Forrester who I'm sure you we were both at the BBC when he came to talk to us. And I loved him. I thought he was so great and inspiring. And I remember him just saying, never underestimate the power of what, what happens next. Mm. And it is just, I, I still, to this day, I will start a program and I will get, you know, half an hour in or get to the end of episode one. And I will think, I don't care what happens next. Mm. And then other shows where without even realizing it, you're like, I want to know. It's like succession. Part of what makes succession brilliant is you constantly want to know what happens next. Mm. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. That's so true, and a very nice little saying. He was, he was, he was very good. Maybe we should try and get him to do an interview for this. Yeah, I'd love yeah. to. I'd love to see him again. He was, yeah, I, I owe him so much. The interesting thing, just to say a little bit more about series one, is that because it was originally, we'd been commissioned for four episodes. Oh yes, um, and I just was. I suppose I'm old school in. I regard, I, I think anything less than six episodes of a sitcom is pointless. And so I went back to Shane and BBC Three and I said, look, can we do, instead of doing four, like 22 minutes, can we do six 15s? And they were like, okay, yeah, no, you know, no. they, BBC Three, I had no idea what this project was. This was totally like, it was like almost off the books. Shane had just commissioned it because he loved Daisy. And so we were totally left alone. And so we did, so we wrote six scripts. We overwrote. And then because of the, because of the shooting style being so, you know, it was all with natural light pretty much. Um, two cameras and everything like within, you know, all within the village so we shot the whole first series in 17 days which is wow. which is pretty unheard of yeah and we overshot and so actually all of the episodes came out between 20 and 25 26 minutes and so actually we delivered a full you know a proper six episode sitcom series and i remember someone at bbc production being very unhappy about it because they were like <laughs> you can't <clears throat> you can't deliver this for the uh, unbelievably small amount of money that they gave us you're going to set a really dangerous precedent um but you know that's where the the product comes first rather than the business and i knew simon kendrick who's the scheduler at bbc3 from doing josh and so once we'd edited a few episodes I was like, I knew how much I liked it. I was like, this is really funny. And so I sent him an email and I was like, I know that nobody ha knows what this is or has any expectations. So it won't be on your like, it won't really be featuring on your like boards or your schedules, but I think it's really good. Watch these, like watch these first two episodes and like, tell me what you think. This is so where new, for new writers, they will have no idea of the power of the scheduler, but the schedulers are incredibly powerful people in making or breaking a, a, anything, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, like it's it's all scheduling marketing. It's like the whole thing that you know it, it happens where a show gets made, and for you know whatever reason, people don't like it, and so suddenly it's like, oh Christ, we've got to like. And so there is not like enthusiasm for promoting it. It's not put front and center. Mm. And so, you know, yeah, part of the, the job of the producer, I think, is like A, to make a good show and then B, make sure that the people that matter also think it's good. 
yes yes <laughs> and yes. then and so yeah from that early from that early point you know simon kendrick was was really liked it really got it and so suddenly it felt like bbc3 were like oh yeah okay we've got something that we can that we can be proud of and then it became about strategy which was that i didn't want it to have like a big I think comedies that launch with a big kind of um, press release often fall flat. And the, you know, the best way for comedies to land is for people to discover them. And then you, you go, oh, my God. And you, you feel that sense of ownership. It's like if it hasn't been forced down your throat, you, you, you're much more inclined to like it and take it to your heart. And then good comedies like, you know, like, anything else if you really like it you're going to tell your friends and you're going to tell people that you like and and that is how this country spread it was through people saying oh, you've got to watch this and that's what you want that's much better than any advertising campaign yeah brilliant brilliant and then there was no question that you were going to do series two no they are in fact they actually i think they commissioned series two and three up front together right so yeah and we still didn't have loads of money but we had like a you know by that point we were a, a legitimate we had enough to go and shoot for five and a half weeks right. and uh, you know it wasn't scrimping and saving on on everything yeah great so how did all of that <coughs> excuse me that's okay how did all of that compare to josh um he well, I suppose always, Josh. He was one of the things that I was thinking was that, for instance, he was already he already had some profile as a stand up in his mind. He was a stand up, sometimes converting the comedy of a stand up into the comedy of a sitcom can can be tricky. Sometimes it can be brilliant. Yes, yeah, I think so. That was that was my first TV project, and I had known. I'd been a fan of Josh for like a long time. Uh, he used to be in a sketch group called Super Clump uh, with some other people that I worked with. Um, and I thought they were really funny. And and so it was, yeah, we'd been talking about stuff. And actually, I would talked to him about doing something for radio. And he just signed with Off The Curb, who are obviously a really good agency. And he was like, I think I'm just too, like, I'm not, he was like, I'm not passionate enough about radio to like, to want to do it. And I was like, that's fair enough. And I was like, I just, I just want to make a sitcom with you. And you he was like, say that well, at that point you were producing both. You were doing radio and TV sitcoms. Well, I was just, I was you just doing, doing radio really. Yeah. yeah. I was just doing radio. And so then when I got a job in TV, pretty much the first person I spoke to was Josh. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm in TV now. Why don't we do it? Like, let's do a sitcom. And so. I cut like a sort of a little taste tape of Josh doing stand up and we worked up a document like a treatment about you know the sort of the world and we knew we wanted um him and Ellis to be the kind of the two the two leads as it were and yeah so I pitched that to the various people at the BBC and there was the that was when they were doing the thing called comedy feeds which is one of the many rebrands why they don't just call them pilots i don't know but um and so we got commissioned to do a 15 minute pilot and that was when the like work really started because we were all very very wary of the pitfalls and yeah i like i'm not a fan particularly of stand ups doing sitcoms and so it's kind of like, how do we make this a legitimate narrative thing in its own right? And I guess it was like the way we conceived of that show was that it was a sort of prequel to um, to One Foot in the Grave and that he was an old man trapped in a young man's body. And particularly felt like a sort of reaction to there was a period under Danny Cohen where BBC Three had got very to my like. So I was I was probably about 24 five around this time 26 so I still regarded myself as relatively young and I had felt that BBC three 
was talking to a bunch of like a, a a load of young people who I had never experienced certainly wasn't the young people that me and my friends were and it was so it was kind of like tapping into yeah the old the old young people the nerdy young people and and because of Josh's and then it coincided that so when we were around pitching that was when he got the the regular gig on the last leg and so it was just perfect timing that his profile had just you know reached a point where B, and then we got Jack D in the pilot so there was enough there that BBC3 were like yeah this is a this is a going concern for both um this country and Josh you've mentioned taste to take mm so would you that sounds like you think that's really important um it's yeah the, yes because the fundamental thing is what you're trying to you what you're doing it, you have to show that what you're trying to sell is funny and it is really about what's the best way of of doing it like for for some things that is literally you just you write a script on spec and if your script is amazing everybody will want it um but if you don't have a script and you're sort of pitching more of a kind of like a performance then it's like how do you like what's the best way of showcasing how funny that that person is so the the taster tape that daisy did was literally her walking along talking to camera and then she gets shoved in a bush and it was like in that you know short thing you saw the you know that she was sort of brash and front-footed but also you know capable of physical sort of clown stuff and you know it just captured so much of what is funny and you know fun about her um, I've just done, I did a taster tape with a couple of comedians last year, which were, and we're working on a, a script for a broadcaster at the moment. And the purpose of that taster tape, well, I just did it on my iPhone and it was just to show the natural chemistry between the two of them talking and how funny they are. And it just lends itself to, you know, it's like then hopefully, you know, the development of that show has really been about bit like this country trying to find the world to to contextualize these people but really it's about spending time with funny people who make you laugh and mm. it's like it's a set that's the that's the only bit like where you you know you just have to you have to sell you have to show it's like um what's it like qvc you're not going to buy that food chopper unless someone is showing you that it's really good at chopping food it's probably one of my worst metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. It's great. It's very good. So that's clearly a tip that you would give to a new writer is, uh, you know, you get your script, but but a taster tape is really helpful too. Um, yeah, my my tip for new, my number one tip for a new writer: if you want to do narrative comedy, it's character, character, character. Everything else comes and falls into place after the character. It doesn't matter whether you've set your show on Mars, on a bin van, on a, you know, in a light bulb processing factory. It's like, yeah, there hasn't been a sitcom for a long time in a funeral parlor. It, it doesn't mean that someone is going, where's my funeral parlor sitcom? It's like, can you, you know, so you start with your character and then it's like what's the what's the most sort of what's the funniest most interesting most trapping context it's like brent, brent david brent is the perfect example it's like here's a guy that wants to be a star he wants to be the cool guy at the party so they make him a regional manager of the most boring company on in the world on a trading estate in slough it's like, like perfect yeah. But no, no one, no one said, "Where's, where's my sitcom about paper manufacturers?" No, we're also writing now as well, which is 
the other, you know, you've, you've turned from, what's it, game poacher to gamekeeper or whatever that's saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, the big change for me was that I, I've always felt sort of confident that I could structure an episode of sitcom. But what I'd never been able to do was get out of my own way as a kind of critical voice. And and also, crucially, it's going to sound but at the risk of sounding pretentious. One of my favourite quotes is, I'm going to attribute it to David Mamet, um, and I hope that's right. But he says, writing's easy. All you've got to do is sit at the typewriter and bleed. And that is so true, and it is true for everything, whether it's drama, comedy, anything. You, you have to tap into something viscerally true and honest. And that might not, it might, doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be from your life, but it has to be from, you know, so it can be from a position of incredible research, but you need to be, you need to be working on like an unbelievably deep level of understanding and honesty and truth. And then you start to unlock something really interesting and compelling. And so that has always been advice I've given to new writers and it's advice I was never able to take myself. And then finally, for many reasons, I like something clicked in my brain and I just started writing something that was very, very honest. And for the first time ever, I enjoyed, first and foremost, enjoyed doing it. And secondly, looked back and instead of hating it and wanting to set my laptop on fire, I thought, actually, this, this is all right. And so then my confidence started to build. And yeah, then, yeah, fortunate, like then sort of, and so the, the producer part of me was, I'd done a pilot with Mickey Flanagan before, which I'd co-written with him and uh, Tom George, the director of this country. And the three of us had kind of workshopped it together and then Tom and I went off and wrote it. But I was also the producer of that. And I found it really hard because we would write, you know, we wrote the episode and then I would sit there as a producer and read it and think, this scene's a bit flat. <laughs> it's a bit boring. <laughs> it needs something else. And then I'd sort of look in the mirror and be like, yeah, I'm all about, <laughs> I'm out of ideas. Um, and so, and that was partly because I was writing in the voice of somebody else, whereas this time now, I'm writing something that's much closer to home. And so do you I can miss, be pretty... do, you, do you think that you miss out by not having the person that was you as the producer, as in having you having a producer? Well, that's the thing. I'm very so I'm developing it for a broadcaster now. And part of the process is I'm trying to put in place lots of people who will be honest with me in the way that that I would be honest with a writer mm. so that you know yeah because all you want to do is make something good and sometimes sometimes part of writing is that you'll get to a line and you'll be like I've got to have a joke I, I know sort of I've got to do something here but I don't know what it is and this is all that's in my brain at the moment and so you write it down and you could if you wanted to spend months obsessing over it and you'll go mad and you'll never finish the script and actually one of the secrets is you just have to get over it and you just put it in and you don't have to worry about it being shit and so it's like even in in my drafts you know in my script at the moment which is you know has been very well received there are still a number of lines that you know they make my like internal organs itch they're so bad and i'm like oh that's so shit i can't wait i need to rewrite that but the overall picture it's like yeah you know you can fix you can fix that. You can make that better. And you just have to be open. When, when I was working, sorry, I'm really waffling on, but when I was working with Josh very early on, and you know, he'd never written a sitcom before, but he was unbelievable. He's incredibly hardworking, incredibly intelligent. And I remember saying to him early on, like, you're really unprecious about like notes and jokes. And there are some writers that, you know, will fight tooth and nail to keep a joke, even though it actually goes really against the character or it really undermines a kind of uh, 
a plot point or a, an emotional motivation. And I remember Josh saying, well, yeah, because if you'll really fight for a joke, what you're really saying is I'm scared I'm never going to write another joke again. And he was like, I can't think like that. I've always got to think that if I've written one, I can write another one. And so I've tried to take that on as well, is that you don't get too attached to any any sort of particular lines. You just... Certainly the wrote, the writers, I've I found that the writers who had that attitude were the were the ones who were a joy to work with. Yeah. That, that if, you know, if you said, this isn't quite making me laugh, then they'd give you three alternatives. If not straight away, they'd go away and think of them. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's brilliant. Okay. Simon, that's excellent. You've been a marvellous interviewee. <laughs> <laughs> thank, no, thank you. I'm thank sorry. I, I, once I get going, I just waffle and waffle and waffle. It's brilliant. So thank you very much. And um, thank you.